There's a new variety of heart failure that has caught clinicians unawares. It has been around since the 1980s, but recently, physicians have noticed that its incidence is on the rise. What is it that is behind this rising menace? There is a category of heart failure that is causing an abundance of problems for clinicians. This entity, known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is increasing steadily in incidence. But the true cause of this condition and the correct treatment for it continue to baffle clinicians and physicians around the world. Heart failure is defined as the inability of the heart to pump blood around the body in keeping with its needs or being able to do such only at the cost of high filling pressures. Patients with heart failure experience shortness of breath at rest or with exercise. They experience chronic fatigue and tiredness. They are not able to tolerate exercise or excessive movement. They may experience swelling of the legs, the ankles, and the feet. Some patients may have a chronic cough or wheezing, or may have white phlegm or pink phlegm tinged with blood. And in extreme advanced cases, they may have buildup of fluid in the abdominal cavity. Traditionally, these symptoms have been considered the result of a weak heart. So how is it possible that we can have people with these exact same symptoms, but with a strong heartbeat? To gain a better grasp of what causes this phenomenon, let us first take a look at the structure of the heart and how it functions. Our heart sits above the diaphragm in the center of our chest and slightly to the left. The function of the heart is to pump blood around the body so as to supply the tissues with nutrients and oxygen carried in the blood. This important organ works nonstop for 80 or 90 years, and most of the time, we're not even aware that it's there. Here we see a picture of a heart sliced in half. We can identify the right atrium, the superior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava, and we can also see the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, which transports blood to the lungs. So blood enters the right atrium through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, and then travels from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and is then pumped by the right ventricle out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. In the lung, the blood becomes oxygenated. It picks up oxygen, and the oxygenated blood then makes its way back to the heart, to the left atrium, through the pulmonary veins that we can see here. The blood leaves the left atrium and enters the left ventricle, where it is then pumped to the aorta and from the aorta into the periphery of the body where it supplies the tissues. Traditionally, all heart failure was attributed to a weak heart, measured with a parameter we call the ejection fraction. But as we shall see, this turned out not to be true. The ejection fraction is the proportion of blood that is excreted or expelled from the heart during the contraction of the heart. On the diagram, we can see a depiction of a heart filled with blood, the number two, red heart, in the relaxed state or diastole. This is when the heart holds the most blood. Upon contraction, the heart expels and extrudes a certain portion of the blood it holds into the aorta and into the circulation. This is depicted here on the diagram by the light green shadow that we see and numbered or labeled the number one. Now the ejection fraction is expressed as a percentage 
that portion of blood that is expelled into the circulation is called the stroke volume and the volume of blood that is held in the ventricle in the relaxed state is called the end diastolic volume here we can see a depiction of the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume the stroke volume being that volume of blood that was pumped out by the heart into the circulation and the end diastolic volume being the collection of blood that was in the ventricle of the heart at the end of relaxation in this case we can see that the amount of blood expelled from the heart is a half of the total volume of blood that was held in the ventricle giving us an ejection fraction of 50 percent this is a normal ejection fraction and patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fractions would have ejection fractions lower than 50 percent whereas the group that we are interested in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fractions have ejection fractions that are 50 percent or greater Beginning in the 1980s, doctors began noticing patients with the symptoms of heart failure, but with a normal ejection fraction, that is, above 50%. These patients experienced the same shortness of breath, buildup of fluid in the lungs and in the legs, as patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Importantly, the incidence of hospitalization, the duration of hospitalization, as well as patient reported quality of life was similar in half bath patients with that found in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fractions. The mortality rate for cardiovascular diseases in half bath patients, patients with preserved ejection fractions, was found to be lower than the mortality for cardiovascular diseases, heart diseases, in patients with reduced ejection fractions. However, the overall or all cause mortality was found to be higher. Patients with half bath also have a higher mortality rate than patients with normal hearts. Not only was this category of heart failure difficult to diagnose, but those drugs that were shown and proven to be effective in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fractions did not seem to work in this group, making this group hard to treat as well. A striking feature of patients with half path is the existence of multiple comorbidities, diseases that go along with this condition. The most frequent comorbidity seen in patients with half path is hypertension, high blood pressure. But other comorbidities such as poor circulation to the heart muscle, arrhythmias or fast irregular heart beats such as atrial fibrillation, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, and obesity are also frequently found in patients with half bath. An ever-present feature of this type of heart failure is the high filling pressure in the left side of the heart. Now we can imagine the filling pressure to be that pressure that is needed to inflate the heart. In this case, that pressure that we need to apply to the pump to inflate the balloon in our model. Now, a high filling pressure would arise in a situation similar to the one that we see here, where someone has placed a belt around the balloon. So in order for us to inflate the balloon, we need to apply a higher pressure to achieve the same amount of inflation in the balloon. Now, there are several pathological conditions that can lead to stiffness of the heart muscle. There may be thickening of the heart muscle, such as thickening that occurs in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or there may be a malfunction of the heart muscle cells. There may be metabolic processes that damage the heart muscle cells, or mitochondrial deficiencies that can lead to malfunction of the heart muscle cells and poor relaxation of the heart muscle. 
Relaxation of the heart muscle is believed to be an active process that generates a suction into the cavity of the ventricle. There may be poor circulation of blood to the heart muscle that leads to a malfunction of the cells in the ventricular muscle, or the heart might be suffering from a process that affects the relaxation of the heart muscle, leading to poor relaxation, or there may be a buildup of fatty tissue around the ventricle that restricts the expansion of the ventricle as blood flows into the ventricle. Other infiltrative illnesses that infiltrate the muscle of the heart and that render it less pliable can also affect the filling pressures such as fibrosis of the heart muscle or amyloidosis. As the condition progresses, this pressure can back up into the system and into the left atrium. We can imagine this to be similar to someone tying a ribbon on the pump stem of our model. Here, in order for us to fill the balloon with air, we need to apply for the pressure. Similarly, in order to fill the heart ventricle with blood, we would need to apply more pressure if the pressure in the left atrium is high. Eventually, the increased pressure reaches the pump itself and the lung. So the pressure is transmitted all the way back to the lung and to the right ventricle. Here it can cause fluid to travel across the walls of the vessels in the lung and lead to fluid buildup in the lung, as well as cause dilatation of the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, and eventually affect the right side of the heart as well. This is depicted here by the red X on our model. Apart from those changes seen in the central circulatory system, the heart, and the lungs, and the great vessels, there also has been found changes in the periphery of the body, in the peripheral circulation. And changes have been found in the capillaries as well as in the musculature of patients with HFPEF. The frequent association of HFPEF with other comorbidities such as diabetes and metabolic syndrome and obesity, all of which are conditions known to cause systemic inflammation, can affect the ability of the capillaries in the body, in the periphery as well as centrally in the lung and in the heart muscle, to produce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a substance produced by the body that causes dilatation of the capillaries and the blood vessels in times of need. And an impairment of the production of nitric oxide can lead to an impairment of the adaptive capacity of the body, leading to shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, and poor circulation. So that the presence of these comorbidities may play an important role in the syndrome of HFPEF. As we can see, HFPEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is a syndrome of multiple etiologies. And for that reason, it is not a one-size-fits-all diagnosis. Clinicians must determine what group a particular patient belongs to so as to render effective treatment for their condition. Studies have established that certain medications can decrease hospitalizations and improve the quality of life in patients with HFPEF. But we shall discuss that in another video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, share, and like, leave your comments in the box below, and subscribe to the channel so we can continue to bring you interesting topics in medicine. Until we meet again, Stay healthy and stay safe.